Well, I'd like to say hi to everyone. I hope that I can help you with your skill set for your various classes. My name is Steve Sykes. I am a full professor here at Essex Community College. That's my contact information, 937-778-7946. My email address is ssykes at edisonohio.edu. So I trust that everyone can hear me. As uh, Rob said, we are going to be doing various uh, sessions. And tonight I plan on covering the first two sessions, uh, the basic uh, manufacturing processes, and then also materials technology. What I'm going to be sharing with you uh, is actually approximately about 64 semester hour credits that we teach here at Edison. And I'm going to do some high points so I can share with you uh, what we would like to see taught in the various schools. We do have an articulation agreement next door with the Upper Valley uh, Career Center. Uh, and they uh, cover at least 70% of what we're asking for. This is the Manufacturing Processes, OET010, SPMET004, the CTAG uh, workshop. The first uh, number of slides is what I presented uh, to the uh, several various schools. To start off with, I'd like to actually just talk a little bit about the definition of manufacturing processes. And again, the steps that we will go through, and I will share that throughout uh, these sessions. And if you think of a manufacturing process, it begins with the creation of materials from which the design is made. Once you have these materials, you modify those per the design, and then you have the process to, be, uh, to a machine or a process or fabricate the part. And again, that may include heat treating, uh, coatings, machining, reshaping the material, uh, of course, we'd like to have assessment verification with quality tests and checks. We'll talk later about what I believe quality should be in the manufacturing and also the planning of the process prior to the manufacturing. So I also start how large can something get? Uh, the company that I worked previously for was French Oil Mill Machine, the company here in Pickway. Uh, and if you look, at this is a 264,000-pound French press of fabrication. In a moment, I'm going to show you uh, the assembly of this, but as you look at it, we can actually get into some very large fabrications, uh, let alone machining. And what's interesting, this was done up in Canada. You can see the uh, snow, and then also the big trailer that they had to use to haul it. That's actually the finished press. Uh, as you look at at the bottom there, you can see two people standing to the lower left. And that press was actually a thousand ton compression press, Altrex press. And what you're seeing in the middle is a composite truck bed or a truck bed for like a shitty S10 pickup truck. And it was our responsibility to go ahead and design, uh, fabricate, manufacture, heat treat, do everything assemble. Uh, this press for the state of Ohio, uh, the Air Force, uh, Ford, Chrysler, and General Motors all went together with this. And they actually, when we were finished with this, they moved this to the old DESE uh, defense plant in Dayton, Ohio. So here we go. So when you look at the manufacturing processes, the OET010, uh, the resources that we've been using for these manufacturing processes, the tag information, uh, again, I will send this out, but you can click those uh, links and you'll be able to get to uh, all that information with the C tag information the rubric for the manufacturing processes, and then uh, Rick and Rob have two course syllabi, which you will also see uh, mine in a few moments. So when you look at the manufacturing processes, teaching materials outcomes, this is actually the flow that I'm going to be using. And uh, as we look down through there, the various outcomes, uh, tonight we are going to be looking at to demonstrate and understand the interrelationship between material properties and manufacturing processes. Again, we're looking at the primary elements of the manufacturing, material selection, various processes, and then how do we come up with those process selections. Later uh, in these uh, sessions, we'll discuss the difference in manufacturing process, such as forgings, extrusions, castings, forming, and finishing. And I will share with you uh, what we do here at Edison as far as the castings and the welding. When we look at distinguishing between the fabrication processes as far as welding, fasteners, and adhesives, 
We'll be going into the data as far as machining, determining the speeds and feeds, how can we optimize production efficiencies, and then demonstrate safety procedures. Of course, we end up doing that every time we actually start teaching a new section here at Edison, uh, the proper safety procedures and methods in manufacturing setting. And again, we'll look at some examples of safety and OSHA requirements. Then we're going to look at demonstrate the proficiency in the use of measuring instruments. One thing that I have found in teaching this course, manufacturing process, is you get people uh, the skill set to try to run an engine and they really do not know how to use various instruments or read a micrometer, read a depth mic, read a vernier. Uh, so uh, we'll be covering a little bit of that. And then we actually will talk a little bit later about uh, what we tour as far as local manufacturing facilities. So when we look at the manufacturing processes, and again, what we're going to be covering tonight is how do we demonstrate and understand the interrelationships between material properties and manufacturing processes? So that's where we're going to go. I think I would like to ask, does everyone hear me okay? You sound good, Steve. Okay. Loud and clear. Okay, good. If I uh, end up going so fast, or if you've got a question, feel free to ask the question, and uh, or text me, and I believe I can see it as it comes up on the screen, and I'll try to do my best to answer that. Uh, sometimes yeah, I get started in some of this, and I just I just keep running, and uh, if I need to slow down, just uh, let me know. So we're going to demonstrate how we un understand the interrelationship between materials uh, properties and manufacturing processes. So end up so doing, I, I will be coming back to this one later. We're going to look at, okay, the introduction to manufacturing processes. As a matter of fact, while I'm thinking about it, I do want to go and cover and show you real quick what we're going to be doing as far as my syllabus. There's my course syllabus. And when we look at my course syllabus, this is of the outline that we do here at Edison as far as uh, manufacturing processes. There we go. I get this up here real quick. All right. I think everybody can read that. So again, we're going to demonstrate and understand the relationships between material properties, the manufacturing processes. It is a 16-week course. As you can see, we meet at 2.30 to 5.15 p.m. Uh, throughout the 16-week uh, semester, I end up actually, I'm going to end up teaching both sections. We have an evening section, section and a day section. Uh, in a moment, you'll see the course text. But we use the modern manufacturing processes. It is the SME uh, book by uh, David Koch. And uh, we use that quite extensively, although you will find out I end up putting a lot of other materials in there. So the first section, as you notice, is exam one. And again, we'll see how far we get with this today. But I'm going to do the lecture on the brief overview course, the introduction of the manufacturing processes, and again, getting a little bit of manufacturing safety, engineering materials, metals, physical metallurgy, and heat treatment. And again, then, of course, uh, I end up giving an exam over that section. And then, as you can see, we'll go into welding, then we'll go into pattern making processes, and then we'll spend quite a bit of time on uh, dimensional metrology, the metal cutting theories, turning processes, the milling processes. Um, and then they have to come up and give me a uh, presentation at the end, and again, I will talk about that. Okay, so here we go. Introduction to the manufacturing processes. And in so doing this, and again, I teach this as a survey. I can really get in depth with it, but I want the students to know we have uh, various engineering students that take this course. Here at Edison, we offer an advanced manufacturing degree, a two-year degree. We offer a design degree in mechanical engineering and then mechanical engineering transfer. All three of those uh, degrees will transfer almost like a two plus two to Miami and also the University of Dayton. There's the text that we're using. There's the ISBN number. It's the Modern uh, Manufacturing Processes text, SME, by Gosh. All right. So the course description then, and again, manufacturing industries are a vital component to all the modern economies. And again, it requires employees who are skilled 
uh, and knowledgeable about the manufacturing processes. I cannot tell you right now, and I'm sure Rob would say the same thing, that I am getting numerous phone calls of various employers throughout this area needing skilled people. Uh, we can't supply them fast enough. I actually have a gentleman waiting on a call for me right now. He wants someone that knows basic CNC programming. He'll do the rest. And I actually have a gentleman I'm going to recommend to him. So that's pretty cool. So, again, as far as the introduction to manufacturing processes, I'm going to give you a detailed understanding of the processes throughout this course, casting, forming, cutting, and joining. And we'll look at all the, as far as material examinations and uh, assessments. So when we think of a manufacturing cycle, again, we look at development, the baseline system, the production, and logistics. A lot of people don't, you know, you think of basic manufacturing, actually the detailed work that we actually get started in that. It's almost like I'm looking at this, I can think of the dimming cycle, uh, which is never open-ended. It's a plan, do, act, control, then go right back again. And so as we look at the development, we're looking at the research, the analysis. And again, a lot of that is what are we going to be doing? A lot of that is also because of what customers require. Um, also to improve our own product. And then we look at the baseline system. And again, we're going to build the prototypes, design, get into production. We're going to plan, uh, make, test. Got to do that. And then, of course, logistics is de uh, delivery and support. So we look at products and manufacturing. We got the creation cycle. We look at the design, the material selection, the process selection, the manufacturer, the inspection, and of course, the feedback. In doing that, we've got a cost breakdown. And what I try to emphasize here is that so many times we're looking at manufacturing costs. And as we can see in a product, we've got administrative sales marketing about 25%, 20% profit if we can get that, and then engineering about 15%, but the manufacturing costs are 40%. There's where we can actually do a lot of cost savings, uh, although I feel that sometimes we can uh, do other areas, especially as far as rework. When we look at the manufacturing process, and again, we're looking at a sequence of operations and processes designed to create a specific product, whatever that product may be. I do share, I have a couple other slides in my class that I share the various industries we have in Miami County, Shelby County, and Dark County, and of course, Montgomery County and Cincinnati area has quite a few uh, various processes. So the process of turning metals into a product. So when we look at the various uh, jobs, openings, careers, and engineering and manufacturing, you've got the manufacturing engineer, the industrial engineer, of course, the materials engineer. And again, they're hunting for that. So then I get into really we talk about the manufacturing systems, the design. We look at like the job shop, in which we have several job shops. There are some job shops that actually support uh, the Honda companies around here, and then the you know small quality of products, uh, jigs and fixtures, etc. They can do a large variety of products if they actually have the facilities to do that. And again, the products move through shop to various machines and general purpose machines. And what we see about a job shop, I actually have one outside of Pickway here uh, called Spring Creek. Uh, they're machinists. They're actually machinists. They can actually operate maybe three or four discipline of machines. When I'm talking about Discipline, I'm talking about lathe, mill, drill, grinder. I'm not talking about five different uh, lathes, if you will. We can look at the flow of the shop. And again, we look at the flow of the shop. Um, we have various companies throughout through here that have uh, large quantities of products. We can think of plastic pack. Uh, they make the Tide bottles, the Pepsi bottles, et cetera, so on and so forth. You have a production line. Here we have uh, Jackson Tube, where they make uh, the big sheet, sheets come in off the big semi-trailers that you see, the flatbeds, uh, when they unload those, they go through a slitting machine, which that's one of my tours that I actually take them in, then they can see that. And then they go through progressive dies and then make the tubing that goes on your desk, your chairs, et cetera. And they just cut off the length. They send them to another distributor or who will bend them or whatever is required to do that. And of course, we have special purpose machines. You got a link cell shop. The link cell shop, and again, we're looking at the manufacturing subassembly cells connected to the final assembly. And again, main production or the one piece flow system. And I think this is interesting. We've also have an opportunity to go through Honda uh, in Marysville. 
and I actually, uh, Russell's Point, we actually went to Russell's Point just several weeks ago. Uh, and again, they can see the various assemblies um, and a, a fine lean production system. Some people ask what the one piece flow system is. Well, let's talk about, let's make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Anybody hungry? <laughs> All right, about another an hour and 10 minutes where you get something to eat. But if you look at a one piece flow versus a batch system, actually what's the difference of that? And we're looking at cost, we're looking at lean. And I just want to get the students to understand that there are different costs, different flows and systems. So if you look at a peanut butter sandwich, for example, a one piece flow, there are two ways to build the sandwiches. We can do the batch or the one piece. So the batch is we build the sandwiches. Uh, I would take three pieces of bread, three lunches to make, if you will, and place the peanut butter on it, then let the three pieces of bread with peanut butter set. Well, I'll take the three pieces of bread and place jelly on it. And for me, I would place a lot of jelly. Then I'd marry the two sides of the bread together and be done. There I have three sandwiches. So if you go to the single flow, I take one piece of bread, put peanut butter on it. Then I take one piece of bread and place a jelly on it. And again, a lot more jelly. And then I'd marry those two together and I would do this three times. So you can see the difference in the flow, the single piece flow approach is much better because there's no waiting involved. Cycle time is shorter because I'm completing the sandwiches at each motion, and I feel better because I can visually see what I've completed as long as I uh, haven't ate any. All right, so you look at manufacturing systems, design. So you got the project shop, and again, the project shop, we're looking at bridges, ships, large airplanes, locomotives, large machinery. In other words, this is the product being manufactured. It cannot be easily moved during the production. So it's like there's they're stay put. So you can look at the shipbuilding, for example. It's, you can just progressively see how they are building the ship and, again, how the production processes are brought into the product. So there's a lot of uh, heavy fabrication there. When we look at continuous process, and, again, we're looking at large plants, again, that could be a product. Uh, so, you know, they utilize the manufacturing of liquids, oils, gases, and powders. So we also look at lean manufacturing. We've talked a little bit about that. That's 100% of the goods, units, or flow from process to process. And again, we look at integrated quality control, and then all employees are inspectors, which we're starting to see that really throughout industry, where we used to have an inspection department. We're finding out that a lot of people at that time were reactive. We were not proactive, and now it seems like we're trying to put the cost and quality uh, with the respective operators. So, as far as the basic manufacturing processes we'll be covering throughout this course, we're going to look at the casting and foundries, the formal uh, forming and metalworking, machining, joining and assembly, rapid prototyping, and again, there's some others I believe I'm going to be adding in there. Real quick, as far as the, count, uh, the casting and foundry processes, I just talked a little bit about the step of taking the materials and transform them into a desirable shape. And again, I will be doing this lecture later on. And sometimes the parts require uh, the finishing processes. Sometimes the part requires uh, machining or even heat treating, uh, stress relieving. And again, the excess material is recyclable. The basic casting process, and again, I really talk about how the mold is created, how the materials is heated, and the molten metal is poured into a mold cavity. And again, as the metal solidifies, then we remove it and we clean it, finish it, inspect it. And again, I will be coming back to that when we get into the processes as far as casting processes. Talk a little bit about forming the metal uh, working processes, tube bending, shape, size, physical properties of the material. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to share with you the hot and cold forming, uh, the different heat treating aspects of metal. Getting into rolling, and again, as the material passes through a series of rollers, uh, reducing its thickness with each pass. There's where I talked about uh, Jackson 2. They have those rolls that progressively roll the shape from a flat area to progressively actually making like in a one inch bar, if you will, with an IV. And again, forming, I, I actually have videos uh, to show. And I'll talk to Rob later on if he wants me to show any of those, but I will have, uh, you'll have access where those videos are at. So those materials, again, I show for, uh, forging, where the material is shaped by controlled application of force. 
and I used the black lit shop, you know, the old, uh, get it red hot and hammer it. All right, extrusions. And again, materials compressed and forced into a die uh, to produce a uniform cross section. We'll be getting quite a bit of that when we talk about getting in the plastic, uh, especially plastics, uh, thermosets and thermoplastics. And again, wire rod tube drawing. And again, the material is then pulled through a die to produce a uniform cross section. Cold forming, the slugs of material are squeezed into the dies. And again, I have a video that uh, shows that. We'll be talking about that. And of course, we'll get into the machining processes. And again, that's the controlled removal of the material from the part to create a specific shape or surface finish. And again, the cutting element is used. And what's really important about the cutting element, which one do we use? Do we use uh, carbide? Do we use diamond? Do we use high speed? And a lot of it really depends on are we looking at the interrupted cut or what's the hardness of the material? And we'll cover that when we get into the leg section. And then movement must exist between the part and, and the cutting element. So again, we look at the uh, turning of the processes, and I'm sure you all have you know, I've talked about when we talk about the engine lathe, they'll be talking about that and the safety there. And again, the workpiece rotates and the cutting tool is fed into the work. So again, in the turning, we're looking at the, the different process, the turning centers, and again, I'll be covering all those different uh, machinings and those processes. Nelly? And again, whether it's a flat or curved surface, uh, we will talk about uh, slab milling, uh, conventional milling, up milling, down milling. So we'll be getting in all those terms, uh, cutting tools, how they rotate with the piece. So again, whether it's a vertical or horizontal, uh, with all of my lectures, I, I try to show some videos of the various processes, whether it's milling, horizontal boring mill, uh, slotting, key uh, seeder, uh, tea cutting, Angle cutting, straddle milling, dovetailing, slab milling. So again, you'll uh, get to be able to see where those processes are at. And what's interesting is, you know, I asked how many people have actually drilled before. And of course, they all raised their hand, and I'll ask them, well, how many of you really sharpened a drill? Uh, mine needs sharp. <laughs> and I get a lot of those, and I say, okay, bring them in. I will show you how to sharpen them. So uh, I end up doing a lot of them, but I try to teach them how to actually sharpen the drill press. So all I think we're doing is uh, creating holes. And again, we're cutting tools, rotate, and fed in uh, non-moving secured work pieces. All right. And again, we do draw, uh, drilling and boring machines, and we talk about counter drilling, step drilling, boring, counter boring. I actually had a one of the courses that the manufacturing students take here is dimensional metrology, and I'm going to share some of that because I need to put that in this course because the design students do not take dimensional metrology, but so they need to know some of my basics in there, again, reading micrometers, how to read blueprints, et cetera. Uh, I actually I gave them a test today, and they've got three weeks uh, to, get, to inspect three parts to give me the dimensions on them. I had a gentleman ask me, what's the difference between a counter bore and a bore? And I know that I covered that, and I just told him, I want you to really think what you just asked me, and look at the print. And after he looked at the print, he goes, duh. So, uh, he actually knew what the answer was. So again, what I'm trying to do is get them to think about that. Shearing, especially in sheet metal, we talk about press breaks, uh, what we're actually trying to do and what's the purpose of those. All right, you know, again, uh, shears away on wanted material. And we look at the shearing process. And again, I supplement this with uh, various videos. Abrasive machining process is grinding. When we talk about the processes of grinding, whether it's, let me go back to that. Uh, whether it's um, a disc grinder, belt sander, surface grinder, vertical horizontal grinders, disc grinders, media blasters, tumblers, but I uh, we get into some of the large industrial grinders, uh, Blanchard grinders, for example. We have a video on those. Talk about some of the thermal and chemical processes, and again, uh, we're starting to see more and more of that. There's no mechanical force used, and again, electrical discharge machines, electromechanical. Uh, we're seeing any more with our uh, advanced manufacturing, the laser, the electron beam. Uh, of course, flame cutting has been along for a long time, so it's plasma arc. As a matter of fact, we just purchased a plasma CNC machine, which I'll take a picture later on and uh, show you what we have here. I'm going also, when I'm thinking about it, I'll be taking some pictures of our lab so you can see what Edison looks like if you've never been to Edison before. But feel free, if you'd like to even bring your class in, uh, I will give them a tour, and as a matter of fact, may even get an opportunity if you have enough time, we'll let them forecast it. So again, you have that open invitation. 
So again, we look at the uh, machining processes. We have already covered a lot of those and uh, end up so doing. Getting into heat treating, one of the things that uh, I want them to understand, one of the courses they actually take here in our engineering is my materials technology, but I do cover it also a little bit in the manufacturing processes. It's where we control heat and cooling of the material to alter its properties while maintaining its shape. I want them to understand the properties, strength, toughness, machinability, wear resistance, corrosion resistance, and again, 90% of the heat treating is performed on, on all steel and other various factors. So again, we look at the, the processes, let me go back to that. When we look at the processes, I actually get into heat treating, I get into normalizing, they understand that, annealing, spiritizing. So we really get talk about all that, and I believe when we get to it today, I will show you the lab that I end up doing. Okay, are there any questions? I'm good here. Okay. Yeah, I'm good here. Thank you. All righty. Good. All right. We'll continue on. I'll get into a little bit more depth here in a few moments, uh, what I, in some of the course. But again, we talk about joining assembly processes. You know, I asked them, can you think of a product which only one part? All right. And again, there's many products that have multiple parts um, that's assembled to form a finished product. And again, the assembly process could be uh, include mechanical fastening, soldering, brazing, welding, and adhesive bonding, which we'll cover a little bit of that. And then how do we join an assembly, uh, assembly as far as processes, the mechanical fastening? Uh, get in, the, of course, the different screws, the bolts, the nails, the rivets, the counter pins, retaining clips, the edge design. When and where should we use those? And even uh, thinking of that, instead of using a nut and bolt, do we use a stud that we actually spot weld? So we can talk a little bit about that in reference to welding. I actually cover this for about three weeks, maybe four weeks in the class. I feel that we have a lot of engineers that understand doesn't understand welding processes. And I will cover uh, later about the processes that we actually cover and what we actually do in the lab. Also, I, I'll just tell you right now, I am a real tickler. That I do believe that engineers need to understand welding symbols. And I spend almost two sessions, almost uh, three sessions on welding symbols alone. Uh, it's more than just chicken feet. Uh, they, re they really are in design, they're really in engineering, they need to understand that. So as far as the welding, we do look at the heat, pressure, both to join the parts. And again, as I said, we'll, uh, we can do gas, arc, or stud, spore, uh, spot, or forge. Resistance and induction welding, we end up doing three here. We do plasma, uh, stick and wire. Um, and again, they just do some welding. I, I, I do, I'm not going to make welding technicians out of them, but it's interesting to see uh, when I talk about stick weld, they stick it. And <laughs> so they see what's going on. I'll talk a little bit about bonding because we're seeing more and more of that, especially in some of the areas around here as far as how do we join the surfaces uh, with bonding material, whether it's glue, cement, uh, thermoplastics, thermosets. Again, in elastomers, I recover about four hours in there as far as talking about plastics. Soldering and brazing, I just briefly cover, but a lot of the kids do this. Uh, our electronics people, of course, they do it all the time. But again, we're looking at uh, putting the surfaces together and bonded together by an alloy and doing the heat and as metal solidifies, they're bonded. So, And then, of course, prototyping. I do believe I have a video on the... Uh, added a process as far as prototypes and the SLAs, SLSs, and FDS. So again, uh, also the finished parts can be tested depending upon the building of the material. As I'm looking at that, uh, we're in the process of buying uh, three new 3D machines. Um, we actually have a small one in our design lab, and I'll probably I'll take a picture of that and show it to you, but my understanding we're getting three uh, brand new uh, 3D machines for a prototype. Of course, when we get other manufacturing processes, we get into testing. Uh, I talked a little bit about transportation, material handling, and packaging, mainly the material handling as far as safety. Of course, when I get into the testing, uh, one of the things I end up doing in my metrology and also in this course is I share with them the various testing instruments. I cover a little bit about the CMM, and but I also cover 
uh, ultrasonics. So how do we check things with ultrasonic? And I will share, share that with you later on. So as far as material, uh, as far as specific manufacturing processes, and again, you've got your plastic processes, your ceramic processes, and then extrusions. All right, and again, I have videos that really show all this, the injection molding. Uh, again, I've already talked about the castings, the rotational molding, which we'll be talking about in castings, blow molding, and thermoforming sheets. And then getting a little bit as far as ceramics, we're seeing more and more of that. Uh, as far as the classes of materials, uh, the flow, how they're cooled, uh, you know, as far as to produce a solid and crystalline ceramics, material shaped and then heated to produce a permanent mold. Okay, so again, we already talked about the manufacturing importance as far as the typical breakdown. So I just reviewed that. There's the one part that I shared with you. Uh, that's the part of that press. And off to the left, you can see the uh, man standing there in a white shirt. And this was the top platen. The part weighed 264,000 pounds. That is eight inch plate. So we talked about a little bit about the design going into this, the uh, fabrication. I actually had to send that to Heat Treat uh, Aberfoyle, which is outside Toronto. But I also had to find a company that was uh, large enough to do the machining. And there was one company in Tor outside Toronto I wanted to get to machine it. And they just could not lift it. It was just way too big. And this company had the crane capacity to do that. So again, that's what you're looking at. Uh, they need to understand the tooling that's required to manufacture that part. All right, so again, we've already seen that. Okay, so when we look at week one, we look at the fundamentals of uh, the manufacturing process. Again, we'll be looking at that. And I really talk about this is more just a summary of the uh, of the manufacturing processes. Why do we do that? Again, I share with the part design. Uh, how do we locate surfaces? How do we indicate parts on a lathe or mill? Uh, how do we do, develop the manufacturing uh, dimensions and tolerances? And how do we design work orders to position the parts on designated locating surfaces? It's basically the CNC. Prior to this class, I will share with you, they are supposed to take blueprint reading and sketching. And some of them even had AutoCAD, so they understand the various uh, parts of the design. So again, when we look at the part design, we're looking at the surfaces that got to be machined. As you see there, I'm looking at a 125 micro. In a moment, I'll share with you that they need to understand what micro finish is and how do we test that. We can see the machine surface location, and again, also with the tolerances. In my Dimensional metrology class, and also this class, I talked about the difference between unilateral uh, tolerance and bilateral tolerances. So again, they'll see that. Uh, we're looking at the locating of the surfaces uh, that's accessible, the proper locations uh, that would make it stable. And again, as we look at how we do process development as far as the process, the tooling, the setup, and again, you can see the little stanchions underneath, the side and underneath that will help us to uh, put it in the fixture so we can uh, look at the machining dimension from the locator, if you will, and then the machine table. And again, we talk about the gauges also. So as we analyze the part design, we summarize all the data you know, as far as the produ uh, production required. We may look at the life of the production run. We may look at what's my lead time as far as required for uh, production setup. Or start up, and again, what's my time study? And I'll share with you, I do a little time study in this class also, so that they understand the speeds and feeds and time. And we'll look at what operations is uh, needed for this required part, whether it's drill, milling, turning, grinding, etc. We're looking at locating the surfaces and determine the feasibility methods. You know, if looking at a volume, you know, if we're looking at only one part, I probably would not put it across the CNC. Uh, if we're looking at 100, I probably would. So again, also what's my available equipment and what's my dimensional tolerance required? What's the service finish required? And again, we'll be seeing this later on, but we'll look at service finishes, the various processes, what finishes can be achieved uh, through the processes, whether we have to hone, whether we grind, whether we machine. Uh, I will share with you when we talk about it, but when we talk about the various service finishes, I want them to remember three. Uh, 
Um, when we remember three, we're looking at a 125 micro finish is just a general applicable machine shop finish. A 63 is a general grinding finish. And then a 45 is a sealed surface finish. And of course, I asked them why would they want a sealed surface to be 16? And I'm hoping someone say, well, because you blow out your seal, there's nothing there really to grab. And if we make the 125, then we're going to tear it. So um, we talked quite a bit, a little bit about that. Talk a little about the cutting speeds and feeds. And again, one formula that you'll see here later on, but RPM equals 4 CS over D. Uh, just a quick formula to come up with uh, cutting speeds and RPMs. Look at the differences as far as the part material and hardness, which that may affect your cutting speed. And what's the difference is in the coolant. We talk a little bit as far as uh, solid oils. We look at combining the operations in sequence. In other words, can there, is there something I could do at the same time, where they have multiple holes at the same plane? And so again, we're looking at gang drilling. Can I do multiple surfaces uh, in the same plane? There we're looking at maybe a shaper or planer that has different heads. And how do I control contours, diameter steps, grooves? That's got to be machine, uh, machined simultaneously. And what's the advantages of combining those operations? And of course, less material handling, uh, fewer machines required in the shop, and it will reduce the labor cost. And we hope overall it, that it does improve accuracy. So we also, how do we be really determine the manufacturing dimensions and tolerances? Well, of course, the gauges are designed to make check the dimensions, but how do we know about as far as part design? And again, as far as work gauges or the final inspection gauges. So I give several examples. These are just some tolerances of drilled holes, and we can see the smallest to the largest. And again, we can look at some of the tolerances there, and again, these are just basic uh, tolerances that, uh, that's applicable. We're looking at, again, is locating the surfaces from dowels, all right? And again, we can do it from a dowel. We can do it from a uh, horizontal location, a face, for example, or we may have lugs on a casting that we'll just clean up for vertical location. I also show them the company that I used to work for at French Oil Mountain Machine Company. I used to uh, manufacture Ford press dies. And when we would get them, the only thing they wanted us to do is machine those lugs, if you will, uh, so that they could take them up in their big plant and with their big equipment and can just set them down and go ahead and do the proper machining that they needed to do with that. And I thought that was pretty interesting. I had an opportunity to actually go up there and see that. Always talk about processes as far as turning, milling, face milling. And again, I have videos to show every bit of this, vertical milling, shaping. They have an issue sometimes understanding what's the difference between a shaper and a planing, planer. And again, I show them as far as the machines on the video. Sawing, cut off. Uh, vertical band sawing, broaching, and again with broaching, I actually talk about key seeing. Uh, spindle grinding, uh, vertical uh, service grinding, and again, Blanchard service grinders, and uh, we supplement this, as I said, with the videos, and of course, cylindrical grinding. Get in service grinding a little bit, and then uh, what's the difference between drilling and reaming, and we'll be covering that section here later on, uh, as far as when do we drill, when do we ream, how much stock do you use, or leave, if you will. And again, what is boring? All right. There's my uh, micro finish chart that I use, and I don't know if you quite see it, but in the dark is the general applicable surface for an essence. So if I would go to drilling, it says I can do from drilling a 250 micro to, let's see, a 63 micro. Um, and again, if we look at, um, let's see if I can find honing, there we're getting to a 32 down to a four. So again, uh, to understand that, they need to understand what is really surface finish and how do we check that with RR, uh, profilometer, et cetera. And I share them with you and I've actually got some gauges that uh, I share with them. So when we look at the diameter uh, variations of uh, basic dimensions, and again, we're looking at it, the different tolerances as far as milling, broaching, uh, honing, uh, grinding, and again, some tolerances that, that you can hold, service grinding, service grinding, et cetera, as far as the process versus the dimensional tolerance, if you will. All right, this is where I have some fun. Uh, we talk about routings. And when we talk about routings, I want them to understand, you know, they're getting the basic material coming into a plant. All right, we need to manufacture that material. And so what I'll end up doing is show them a print 
and I will say, okay, I'd like for you to route that through my plant, and I will show them the machines that we have out in the plant, and you go ahead and do the routing for me. Uh, and, and sometimes uh, the basic one is something like this. I'll ask them to, uh, first of all, just give me the machine or the process, um, and again, the operation number, and then later on, I'll add them add the operation description and if there's a locating surface. With this, I will also at some time add a routing where they actually have to give me a time study. So in other words, they may have to cut, figure out well, how long is my cut, how many cuts can I take, what's my uh, parameters as far as depth of cut, what's my RPM, what's my speed that I use, and what's my cutting speed. And of course, the cutting speed is going to change your time, especially if you're going from high speed to carbide, and I want them to see that, the difference in the cost. And there's my formula. RPM equals 4 CS over D. And again, it's uh, simplistic. It's RPM is revolutions. D is diameter. C is cutting speed. And again, I want them to remember that, especially on a test. So I'll ask them, okay, what's the RPM that should be used for a diameter of 6.25 and a cutting speed of 180? Give them a little bit of time to figure that up, and then when they come back, and again, I show them the, the proper procedure, how they can come up with the RPM. Still at the same time, when I show them the RPM, I, I will tell them that, you know, you may take this out on the engine lathe, you will not see 115.2 RPM. What you end up trying to do is get to the closest RPM that you have in your uh, headstock. So I want to look at time. And again, time is length divided by uh, feet, per, uh, feet, feet inches per minute. And uh, as far as your, uh, the multiply times your RPM. So I give them a time, you know, what's the time required to machine a 6.250 diameter part, 20 inches long, and a feed rate of 15 thousandths and a cutting speed of 180. And again, I want them to come up with that as they look at what's the time required to machine that. And I hope they can come up with it. And what's interesting is they ask me sometimes, how do you break down the seconds? So again, you just have to multiply that 0.57 times 60. Uh, some of them that doesn't quite understand that and we just need to do a little basic math. All right, so we talked about the revolutions per minute as far as diameters. And again, this is a table. A lot of these tables you get out of the machine's handbook. Um, this is out of the operator's manual as far as currently the operator's manual from Warner Swayze that's available. I asked the students, one of the things that's an option in our class is to purchase a machinist handbook. And with you purchase the machinist handbook, I'm thinking they're on the 20, 22nd edition. 28th edition, I think, okay? Maybe 28th or 29th, I think I have the 28th. If you watch where you purchase those, you can get a CD that comes with it. And that's pretty nice. So if they have a computer, they can have access to the CD and <coughs> pardon me to actually look up the various RPMs, the fees, the materials, tooling that's available. Uh, when I'm thinking about sidebar chart, we'll talk about a little bit about that in dimensional metrology. They can look up a trig part, a trig, table for a sidebar chart. So uh, it's a very useful tool to have out in the plant. This is what I let them use for cutting speeds and service feet per minute. So I'll tell them, okay, I'm, I'm machining a, uh, let's say when I'm looking, a 1035 steel. So you can look at the workpiece material. If you look at high speed versus carbide tip, and again, you can see the rough. You can see the finish. And again, we're looking at the cutting speed. Are you using coolant? And again, purpose of that is I will tell them, we're gonna manufacture a part. So I'll tell them what the part is. And I'll tell them, okay, you're gonna be using high speed. And then I want them to give me a quote for that. And then I will tell them, okay, I want you to use carbide and give me a quote for that. So I want them to see the differences of what cutting speed means, the difference between the high speed and the carbide tip. So I actually I give me a quote for that. There's what I actually asked in the quote. It's very simplistic. It's a very basic diameter part. I tell them to use 1018 steel. You're using a two inch diameter cutter. I will tell them that the depth of cut, rough is 125. That's max, so that's 125 on the side. Um, and again, uh, 62 thousandths for finish. Then I tell them the feed, and I tell them the feed for finish, tell them the feed for rough, 
and I'd give them a shop rate, which is pretty cheap. I think I need to change that, but it's sixteen fifty an hour. But then also tell them, okay, you got an over, overhead rate of 250 and I want them to give me a quote. And it's interesting because I, I will get various, various figures, diversity in the figures, um, as far as the high speed and the carbide. I want them to see the vast difference as far as the quote, if you will. And I may tell them, I said, well, guess what? You just lost your company some money. You told me you'd sell this part for, let's say, $1.50, and it's supposed to be $5. Or I could also say, um, guess what? You're way too high. You're, you're supposed to sell it for, let's say, $1.50 again, and you're, you've got a quote that's $3. So, again, you're not going to be able to uh, sell that part because you're astronomically too high. So, again, that's where I come back, and I want them to understand the process as far as the cutting speed and then using those formulas for time and RPM and give me that quote. All right, any questions? I had a lot of fun with that. No, I, I, and this is Mark Jackson. I, I actually have to cut out. Uh, I have uh, my licensure class that I, I'm taking to, but uh, I appreciate it. Now I'll, I'll be, I'll see you Thursday. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, no other questions, and I'm going to get into the materials. So we talk about getting into materials a little bit more in depth, and I want them to understand what we're really looking at as far as engineering materials. <laughs> and again, I hit, of course, the manufacturing processes. I probably cover 85, 90% as far as the metals. The ferrous metals, the steels, the stainless steels, two and die steels, the cast steels, cast irons. Get in a little bit as far as the non-ferrous. There's your aluminum, the copper, titanium, and tungsten. We'll have one lecture, um, mainly three hours on plastics, thermoplastics, thermosets, and elastomers. We'll talk a little bit about ceramics and the composites. So there's the one of the videos that's got a link that you, you go to metals and non-metals, and it will actually show them uh, that video. So it's pretty interesting. It's, I think it's about a 10-minute video. When we look at carbon stills, then, I want them to understand truly what carbon stills is all about. So when we look at it, uh, I want them to see what the percentage range as far as carbon to be in there for a carbon steel. It does include other small amounts of silicon, sulfur, manganese, et cetera, uh, but it, uh, it's 97 percent iron. I want them to know that the carbon content in steel will vary from 0 0.05 up to 1.7, but seldom exceeds the 1.5. And I want them to understand really what happens during heat treat or if we add more carbon to the steel, <coughs> pardon me, in other words, tensile strength is increased, and of course, greater hardness is obtained. And if hardness is obtained, then of course, the ductility is going to decrease. So I want them to understand that, and of course, weldability will decrease. We'll cover that quite a bit when we talk about welding. Talk about when still considered to be a carbon steel, and again, that's the various parameters, uh, certain grades. It's interesting, uh, they have boron now that will improve hardenability. Uh, you know, again, or aluminum for the oxidation and also to control grain size. So boron, you know, it says the addition of boron will improve hardability, and that's pretty interesting. Uh, the carbon steels, again, as we've said, contain small qualities of other elements or impurities. And uh, we'll show a video the difference between hot rolled and cold rolled or drawn uh, carbon steels. Their uh, chemical composition, we'll talk to you here in a moment the quality and the end of the production forms. So here's where I really get involved with it. I want to know and understand the differences between low, medium, and carbon steel. So again, this is a test question, by the way. They, they need to tell me as far as low carbon steel, it has less than 0.30% carbon content. It's called mild steel. And what's interesting is a lot of times on the exam, they'll tell me mild steel is medium carbon steel. No, it's not. Okay, it's low carbon steel, and we'll share with them the various products, the screws, the nails, the washers, the wire, the miscellaneous machine parts that do, that do not require high strength. Get into medium carbon, 0.3 to 0.6 carbon content. Of course, because we're adding more carbon, it's going to be less ductile. It's going to become harder, has greater strength versus low carbon steel. Here we're talking about the shaft, the rods, the gears, the spindles, other parts requiring medium strength and wear resistant surfaces. Uh, here we're also looking later on as far as high carbon steel, 
uh, 0.6 up to 1.7. As I said, some exceed 1.5. Here we're looking at the highest strength and the hardness, and again, responds rarely to the heat treatment. I end up, when I end up talking about this, I will ask them, okay, what would you like to have a gear in your transmission? What kind of steel? Um, and of course, uh, I hope they pick the right one, you know, because we're already looking at shafts, medium carbon steel. I'll say, okay, why not low carbon steel and why not high carbon steel? And, you know, they're talking that uh, they're looking at, you know, stress cracks, things happening, it's too hard, it's too brittle, especially when you're talking about uh, high carbon steel. And again, there we're looking at cutting tools, cable, music wire, and cuttery. So when we list everything plain carbon steels can do, as far as the properties, uh, it also consists of limitations. So again, I re-identify the various limitations of the plain carbon steel. Why do we add elements? Uh, we talk about the why do we have phosphorus? Uh, why do we have silicon? Why do we have oxygen, hydrogen, and sulfur? Various plays a role, again, for as well as ability to improve hardness. Types of steel. And again, when we talk about types of steel, we talk about the reaction of steel making as far as the excess carbon combination of carbon oxygen to form gas. We talk about the four types of carbon steels, how they're produced. I have, a, oops, pardon me, I have a video on that as far as killed, semi-killed, rimmed, and capped. And then the manufacturing, we talk about, again, the hot roll, uh, you know, the purpose of those hot rolls, the grain structure, and then getting into uh, recrystallization. Uh, going what's final grain size influenced by the original grain size, the rate of the cooling. They'll see this later on in heat treat, the amount of deformation, and the finishing temperature. Talk about what does it do? And anisotropy, fibrous quality of the rolled steel, and then how we get ingots formed into different shapes, slabs and blooms, and billets. And then we talk about how a slab is, and you know, what a slab is, and what's a bloom, how it's made. Uh, billets, um, again, made from, you know, bloom or around square and cross sections, and then round billets. Bar sizes, square billets, and I have a video that will show them uh, a steel company where actually they, you'll see the various uh, stock sizes and shapes uh, out in a yard or out in a plant. Continuous casting, again, the molten steel, how it's produced, and I have a video for that also. And then the rolling mills, which we've actually talked a little bit about that far as the uh, beams, the channels, the angles, uh, you know, talking about hot roll, uh, the advantage and universal mills, okay? Cold roll, uh, the pickling, lime water, um, and how it's processed, how it's performed, and what's the advantages. Galvanizing, how many of us remember that? <laughs> Again, we talk about galvanizing, you know, I, I will ask them, you know, uh, name a product that's been galvanized. And again, I ask them what their competition is as far as galvanizing. And if you can think of that, uh, epoxy paint is uh, a competition with that. Rob may know of something else, but uh, believe it or not, I think plastics has taken the place of it a lot. You think a lot of uh, plastic fences anymore instead of galvanized fence. And again, there's a... Uh, a video still from start to finish, and again, we look at bars, and again, all I have to do is click on that link, and again, you'll have a process to that. And then I say, okay, what's the difference? Uh, when we look at 1018 hot roll, we look at 1018 cold roll, uh, so we can look at really what, what that number is all about. Talk about forging, and again, there's another video, how to make uh, steel forgings. And then we talk about grades, and I hit this pretty heavy. The grades are, you know, as far as the note, the chemical composition of the steel, and why do we have certain grades, and what is the grade destination? I hit pretty heavy on SAE, uh, the Society of Automotive Engineers, and AISI, the American Iron and Steel Institute, and what are the prefixes for and the suffix. So then I show them, okay, we're going to get started. We look at 1018, we look at 51120. What are those numbers, and what do they stand for? So again, the first digit is the principal alloy. Uh, the second digit is the amount of the principal alloy or the percentage, and the last two or three digits are the uh, percent of carbon. And I will give them, this is uh, another test question. With the first digit, they need to understand, okay, what's number one? What's number two? What's number four? What's number seven? 
So if I look like, say, uh, 2118, maybe you should tell me it's a nickel steel. And if I tell them uh, 51120, that it's chromium steel. Okay, the question was, how many class periods um, do I have? And no, is that question, is that do I have for this or do, do I have, I have two class periods a week. And that class period is two and a half hours a day. So I actually have them for five hours a week. Hope that answered that question. Yes, the other question. Yeah. I was curious, uh, the material that you cover, including videos and stuff, so how many weeks then does it take for you to get through, for example, this material that you're showing us now? Okay, it takes me, I'm going to say, approximately two to three weeks. Okay. Yeah, about two to three weeks. And really depends, okay, it really depends on how much experience they've had prior to this. Yeah. And then, I mean, what, 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 what might be an example lab that they're doing throughout this period? What, what is some of the stuff they're doing? Okay, I'm going to show you that. Okay, good. Right. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to get into that here in a few moments. All right, great, thanks. Yep. Okay, so again, we're looking at plain carbon stills. Uh, again, the, the digit, what it looks for, the 4140. Uh, then I also talk a little bit about the plain carbon still identification. So if, again, if it's the acid Bessemer process, the basic open heart furnace process, there we're looking at the suffix H. Applications of the steel, when do we use certain applications as far as the ASI, the SAE material selection? Uh, again, the chromium, uh, various parts. Generally on this, what I'll end up doing is giving them a uh, test on, okay, I want to make a, uh, a gear or a shaft, which material should I use? What do you recommend? Or I want to make a spring. Uh, so again, I just want them to understand the materials and the applications. A little bit more uh, steel carbon classifications, and a little bit more in depth, especially the nickel steels. And again, of course, you can have the chromium steel as a low carbon, medium carbon, or high carbon. And then how they're classified as far as categories, chemical properties, mechanical properties, physical properties. And again, the chemical properties that we're looking at. Uh, and then uh, what is hardness? It's interesting what I'll end up doing there is hardness is resistance to penetration. I'll ask for a volunteer. You know, I ask what hardness, and of course, they'll just go all around tell me what hardness is, but they really won't tell me what it is. It, it, well, it's, it's, it's hard. Well, you can't tell me it's hard for hardness. And I want them to get to resistance to penetration, so they usually won't come up with it. So I ask for a volunteer, and I actually have an X on my wall, which is a block wall, and I'm saying, okay, in a moment, I want you to take your fist, and I want you to hit that as fast as you can. Of course, ah, I'm not doing that. Well, why not? Well, it's hard. Okay, well, it's hard. So I try to show them uh, that hardness is resistance to that penetration. As we go through the properties, I'm going to spend a lot of time on these. I know you want to get to the lab, but we're looking at the plasticities, brittleness, toughness, creep, fracture, stress, strain, and again, there's the physical properties of the metals, the uh, strength, tensile strength. I want them to understand the main four as far as mechanical properties. When do we design things for tensile, compression, shear, and torsion? And again, the important properties of the steel, thermal properties, the uh, electrical properties, the chemical properties. And here we're getting a little bit as far as uh, comparison of the cooling methods. You know, as far as hardening, uh, making it stronger, making it brittle, uh, as far as quenching, what happens. And I'm going to show you in a moment of a process we end up doing with that. And of course, the physical with the mechanical and the chemical, uh, as far as the uh, reactivity. Density, melting point, specific heat, thermal conductivity. Again, we're getting into some uh, nomenclature. And what's the requirement for alloy steel? So I'm going to just go through this pretty quick. But again, you know, what's an alloy steel? And how, how are they classified? The alloy tool steels, uh, the addition of alloying elements as far as the purpose to do that. And the different alloys. Why do we have boron? Why do we have chromium? Why do we have copper? Why do we have lead? And why do we have nickel, titanium, and, and, and vanadium? And again, to help out with that. And we talked a little bit about stainless. And again, chromium makes it stainless steel. And the different uh, basic types of the stainless steel, martensite, ferretic, austenite. 
And how do we, if I got a part out in the shop, how do I really know what I have? Well, you can do a visual. And of course, depending on what it is, you can do the magnetic test. Uh, of course, the hardness test, I'm going to cover that here after that, and then the scratch test hardness, and of course, the foul hardness. Chemical test, uh, you actually have a uh, unit out there. We can actually put different acids out there, and then we'll turn it to shape of color. You look on a chart, it will tell you, okay, you have 4140 versus 1018. Uh, the spark testing's pattern, and the machinability test is the ease of the cutting. And what material should we use as far as uh, metal selection and use? What do we need to determine the strength, machinability, hardness, weldability, fatigue resistance? Okay. And then what's the cost of the steel? And the cost of the steel is the per weight, and they've got to come up with how to come up with so many pounds, and they're paying so much a pound for that. So they come up with that. As I said, we get in some of the tool steels. And again, the flow chart is still making. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but again, all this here, I have videos. And we also talked about the number system, uh, color code system, and then getting into a spectrograph that they can actually break those down and know exactly what we have as far as getting into one of those machines. Okay, that's a lot of materials, and I want to get into, let's see, I think this is where I want to go. Let me check. Yep, heat treatment. I'm going to check here a second. I think this is, we'll go through this some pretty quick. And then I'm going to get into a lab. Okay, as far as heat treatment, I want to understand truly what's the difference uh, that happens in heat treatment, why we do heat treatment, heat treating operations. And again, what type of operations are we doing? And again, uh, what's the information we need for optimum heat treatment? Well, you need to know what you're starting off with. You need to know your critical time and temperature, what's your response time, what's your desired hardness and or strength. And why do we heat treat? And again, remove stresses or grain structure, uh, secure the proper drain structure or to decrease hardability or increase hardability. And the different types, and again, thermal treatment of steels and as we're going through this. And then I give them a little bit as far as crystalline unit structural space lattice, uh, the six main structure lattice structures as they look at that. They can look at the BCC uh, base centered and again, still under the 1333 has this arrangement. It's also called alpha iron ferrite, FCC. And again, we know what it looks like. The, and again, we look at examples of the steels. Hexagonical, again, what it looks like. And examples of some of the steels. And then the cooling curve. I really want to start seeing this. What happens when we have temperature rise in time? What happens with those space lattice structures? And again, underneath a crystalline pattern, what, what does it look like uh, as far as like this is 1020 still? Shows in the carbide to grain size and how it changes when we go from perlite to austenite to martensite. We'll see that in a moment. And again, the heating, the cooling, uh, there's your perlite, ferrite, austenite, and then the heating. Uh, that 1333, this temperature right here, is a uh, what I call the critical uh, heating rate. Uh, anything above that, you know, again, you need to get what's called the transformation temperature. And then you look at the 400 degrees. So these are two temperatures I wanted to remember that it's got to be around 1333. It's got to be below 400 to obtain optimum heat treatment. And again, it talks about the austenite cycle and again versus cooling and then going back to martensite. So any steel we heat, we go up to austenite, we cool, it goes to ferrite, and again, we quench, it goes to martensite. To do that, and again, we have the chart. We look at the what becomes ha what happens with the metal compared to the characteristics as far as ferrite, austenite, martensite, and again the various grain structures. They, again, there's a video, basic idea uh, idea of the heat treating the crystallization process that I use, and the grain size versus cooling time, and then the effect of the grain size. Okay, I'm leading up to something here, and again, the ferrite, the martensite properties. And again, smaller the grain size, larger grain size, what happens to the metals. There's another basic idea of heat treatment that's still in effect on the grain size. And then material science and mechanical engineering, heat treat explained. So really it talks about that. With that, this is my invention. I want them to really understand the heat treating phase. 
in my lab, and I'm going to share this with you in a few moments, but I actually have uh, five unknown parts of material, and I'll share that with you. But I want them to understand the heat treating phase. So when we go from perlite at room temperature, we go above the 1333. We're in the austenite stage, and that's FCC, gem iron. So again, we're looking at the transformation temperature. And then when I quench it, we go to martensite. So that's ferrite quenching becomes the, uh, the most brittle, that's a critical cooling rate. I want them to understand the process. I tell them, okay, we're going to three different rooms. In my exam, they have to give this to me, all right? And I want both, I want it explained, but I also wanted a chart to show me what they're explaining. So, and again, it's so much like, if they show this to me, then they're doing very well. Uh, we are going to uh, austenite, equalize, and quench. And again, it's really critical as far as the soak time and temperature, and really depending on the size of the part. But uh, that's uh, that's a good way that I use to explain really what happens uh, during the heat treating phase. Okay. So again, hardening by quenching. Uh, and again, we talk about uh, martensite. It's quite unstable. And we look at the low carbon steels, the oil and air hardening steels. We talk about grain size. And, and we already seen this, and I think we've seen most of this. Okay, we talk about full annealing. Why do I anneal? And again, what's the purpose of it? Why do I stress relieve? Okay, full annealing. Why do I normalize? And again, normalize is heating at above the critical temperature, cooling it at room temperature. Uh, it's still air, all right, in room temperature. Uh, what's the process? Why do we end up doing that? And again, uh, talk about the hardenability of the steel. I'm going to go back real quick. When we talk about full annealing, uh, or we talk about uh, normalizing, one thing you've got to watch out for, a company that, that we set parts to for heat treatment, we were getting uh, surface cracks, uh, very fine surface cracks. We couldn't understand it. They couldn't understand it. Well, when they were normalizing, they would drop it on the floor. So when they dropped it on the floor, we know that that floor is probably 50 degrees. So in essence, they were quenching the outside of that material, causing an stress crack. So that was, that was pretty interesting. Okay, so we look at full annealing. Again, hardenability, quenching media. You talk about the quenching media, and now we're talking a little bit about, okay, I want to carburize something. Uh, I want the outside to be hard. I want the inside to be ductile. So what is carburizing, and how do we end up doing that? In the different applications is uh, industrial applications, the pack, the gas, the liquid, okay? And nitriding, and again, I have a video that we see on that. Uh, flame hardening, when do we do that? And again, I share with them generally about gears, is that when we flame harden or induction hardening. And that is that. Okay, any questions on that? Do your students also take a materials course? Yes, they do. Okay. okay. Yeah. What I'm doing, they, okay, go ahead. Do they go through some of this stuff in materials as well? Yeah, yeah, they do, but I get more in depth with it. Okay. Yeah, I get really in depth. To me, the, I pull out the high points here, all right, so they understand, but when they, uh, it probably really first week is about all I cover in materials, and we start getting really in-depth with it. Okay? I mean, we really get into the crest line structure. We get in, into the uh, physics and chemical aspects. Okay? Okay. Here's my heat treating experiment. What we end up doing here, and um, I, I will show you the materials here in a moment, but the objective is to Come up with, I will give them five unknown parts of materials. They have to tell me what it is. They're, they're going to list the materials. They are going to heat treat the materials. I'll, they'll tell me the equipment they use, the procedure, the data, and the conclusion. So when they do their lab, I give them this sheet, you know, what's the objective, and their objective is I'm hiring them as a consultant. I give them five unknown specimens. They are different shapes, and you'll see that here in a moment. They got to come up with what the materials, what's the equipment, what's the procedure, what's the data, and what's their conclusion, what's their finding. With that, I'm hoping what they will show me, they'll say specimen one, specimen two, specimen three, 
you know, what's the uh, Brunel hardness? And again, I cover Brunel, I cover Rockwell hardness, uh, the different hardness aspects of Sleroscope, uh, which we have these out in our lab. And again, I'll take some pictures of that and show it to you. We have, uh, what's the RC hardness? So we understand what RC is and how do we transpose Brunel into RC and then come up with a tensile strength. To do that, there's where they, they come up with, with the materials. So there's my materials. Now they don't see that. What they'll see is this. I want them to heat treat all specimens. And we have a heat treating furnace in our welding lab. And I try to control the temperature. Uh, I want them to temper parts. I want them to anneal some parts. I want them to normalize some parts. With that, they've got to do the chart that I showed you as far as checking the hardenability of all those parts. And I'm hiring them as a consultant. I'm asking them, okay, you tell me which one is which and why did you pick that? So it's, in other words, they're a consultant. I don't know what I have. Tell me what I have. And I'm hoping that by doing that, that they come up with this, that the one inch is 1045. Of course, you've got the 1215, the 4140, the 8620, and the 1018. With that, what I'm showing is they better not tell me 1018 is the hardest, hardest part. That, that's not going to happen. Uh, again, because of the various uh, parameters and the hardness that they're going to come up with, uh, they should not see the 1018 being that hard. Uh, of course, the 4140 to 8620 is going to be hard. And of course, the uh, 4140 to 8620, sometimes it's hard because of those, because of the uh, chromium content. Uh, and then the other content as far as the Molly for the 4140. With this, uh, I have them work in groups, usually about four to a group. I will have them do me a lab report, individual lab report, and then their recommendation, and then they have to get up in front of the class and give me a presentation. With a presentation, they've got to show me their data, they've, or uh, the other classmates, they're showing the data. And their explanation, the processes that they use. So again, I want to hear when they normalize. How did they do that? Uh, I don't want that. I don't want to hear it say, "Well, we kept it in the furnace." Well, that's not normalization. That's full annealing. So again, uh, that's what we're looking at there. And again, I want to make sure they understand the processes. And then, of course, they'll come up with recommendations, and they'll say, "Okay, we believe the one a square is 4140." Sometimes they'll tell me it's 8620. Uh, but again, I, they, I better not tell me that 1018 is the hardest one. I'm hoping 1018 is the softest one. And what's interesting that there, I want them to tell me it's not conclusive because uh, it was testing less than 22 Rockwell C. Anything like that is really not conclusive. We just know it's that soft. With that, uh, that's how I grade it. That's how I grade their presentation and I grade their data, their data sheets. Uh, did they follow the process? And we have a lot of fun with it. This here takes um, about, well, two class times, maybe three. And uh, I actually have students that will videotape grinding. So they'll do spark testing. Now, with spark testing, uh, they have to have something known to compare the sparks. If they ask me, I will give them something known. I will give them a piece of 1045. I will give them a piece of 4140 if they ask me. I don't volunteer that information. Um, so I've actually had them take videos out here on our pedestal grinder. I've actually had them take videos out there on the surface grinder. So you can see those parts. Uh, they'll stick to the magnet, and they'll get out there on the surface grinder and, and clean them up. I, if you notice, uh, the part here, as we look at, you can see the saw blade uh, contour, if you will. Uh, I've actually had students who ask me if they can go out and service grind those to, to get a better idea, to know where they're at. And again, uh, by that time, uh, it's either that or I will do it for them. If they haven't had the uh, process as far as the service grinder, I will show them how to do that. So again, we have a lot of fun, a lot of fun with this. Um, I would say uh, probably 75, 80% of the time they will get it uh, probably 80% correct. I've had students to get it 100% correct or had groups to get it 100% correct. But it's uh, just a good way that they understand that heat treating phase that I talked about going from perlite to austenite to martensite, understanding what happens when you add the various alloys and the higher the carbon content. And again, it's pretty cool when they end up showing me a video of various their, uh, their application of how they came up with uh, their recommendation. 
Any questions? I'm good. Okay. You can use, you know, the various, I use this, these size of materials because of, uh, uh, it's easier to just put them in the furnace. You know, you don't want anything real large. Okay. All right, that's my heat treating. All right, then I summarize the manufacturing process. Coming up, we're coming to a close here. But again, we just, you know, what's your thoughts on the manufacturing environment? You know, uh, you know, if they've worked in a manufacturing firm, I asked them to try to explain that. Um, what kind of job have they done? What have they seen? They'll, again, they'll say, you know, my dad's done this. Was the, you know, the, uh, how was the pay? Or is there any additional comments? Again, a little bit of the history as far as manufacturing, uh, as far as the processes, names and processes. Get a little bit of history because of, uh, we need to. Uh, that they understand the, uh, you know, again, the father of scientific management. Where do we go? I mean, I, they probably need to update this because personal computers in 1980 were way beyond that. And again, the 1980s, 1990s is right out of the book, but uh, I think they just need to update that. Uh, integrated manufacturing. And again, there's a lot of videos here, all right, as far as manufacturing, uh, what it's all about. Uh, we look at the organizational as far as the company, the sim well. So they understand that process. What activities? A little bit of review. Uh, these are the local companies. Now, what I ended up doing here is uh, I tell them in a three-county area, I want to know, first of all, what machining, assembly, or finishing can I get done, and what companies are out there. So I want them to, to know, first of all, what manufacturing is all about. And, you know, Whirlpool, well, they make mixers out of Greenville, Crown, Tow Motors. Uh, Vercells, Midmark Vercells, uh, Mr. Machine, and Fram is in Greenville, and Remco Motors, the various uh, motor assemblies. Um, uh, again, I uh, I could use French oil, but they wouldn't understand that. That's just oil mill processing equipment. But I have them in their groups, the same groups that they use in their lab, uh, to look at the various industries around this area, what's available. Uh, with that, I will also, if I have enough time in my dimensional metrology, I will have them okay. I want to start a company. I want to know where can I get calibration done. I want to know where I can buy various equipment. I want to know where I can buy outside micrometers, verniers, death mics. I will tell them I would like to limit them to uh, the three-county area, uh, Dark, Miami, and Shelby. And if I need to, then at some time I'll tell them they can go to Montgomery County. So again, when we're looking at the processes, how we actually collect every one of those, the forming, the forging, uh, again, the heat treating, and we'll be uh, talking about every one of those. And again, the manufacturing processes, I'll ask them to identify some uh, material removal processes. We'll be covering those later on in this process, and then I'll really get into the various parts of the equipment. Uh, this talks about the lathe, the video on the lathe, the uh, vertical milling machines, how large some of it can get. Uh, what's interesting here, it's a you know, steady rest, so they can see that and how large they can actually get. Uh, or actually, it was, it was steady rest, but that was actually a boring mill. Uh, service grinders, we have one like this out in our lab. Uh, again, the grinders, it almost looks like a planer. Uh, centerless grinder. Okay, rotary grinder, IDOD. Um, Blanchard grinder. And then we get into drilling. And again, I'm going to cover this later on more in detail. Drill chart. Uh, how do we drill on lathe? And reamers, processes, bandsaw. Vertical saw. There's the uh, shaping. There's the planer. And you really have issues sometimes understanding the difference between that. Broaching. Slaughter. Doing a keyway. Boring. Again, boring. <laughs> 
pretty neat. I got a video that actually shows that, how they did that. And then I get into the different types of that uh, industrial skilled workforce, uh, the disciplines that's out there. And again, all around machinist. And again, the good old enjoy. We'll cover this later on, the other various machines. Plasma burn machine, as I said, we just got this in. We have one, uh, CNC. Uh, we've uh, actually only bringing two parts on it. And then die making, tool making. Mill rights. And then the activities. We just spent a lot of time, but we'll get into castings. Processes. I'll be talking about this when we talk about the process. And uh, we already talked about the heat treatment. So again, they, there's my, I love that chart. So, all right, any questions? Okay, Rob, that's all I have as far as the processes. That's what I have as far as the materials. Uh, and then if we go back, come back here again, I believe that um, we'll be getting into uh, welding next, uh, the welding symbols, the welding lab. And we may just flow in a little bit as far as uh, the lab that I end up doing there uh, and getting into the, that will flow into the casting processes. Uh, and then I'll spend quite a bit of time on the metrology and the machining processes. Good. 